Dana Miller presents the ninth annual Obesity Conference, a practical look at obesity, diabetes, and current strategies. Featuring Philip Snyder, DO, very low calorie diet. All right, um, we're gonna switch back to uh, diets. Um, I know that we had talked about a variety of different diets, including VLCDs, uh, uh, sort of indirectly. This whole talk is gonna be on uh, very low calorie diets, and I'm really pleased to um, introduce Phil Snyder. Uh, Dr. Snyder, he's the medical director of the Bon Secours Weight Loss uh, Institute in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, he's a background of working with patients on lifestyle change and worked as actually a registered dietitian and a personal trainer prior to medical school. Uh, during that time, Dr. Snyder also taught nutrition at UNC Greensboro. He's board certified in family medicine and also um, obesity medicine as well. In addition to being a member of the medical advisory panel for the Robart Corporation, uh, he lives the lifestyle he advocates, which is awesome. Um, he com competed in over 100 triathlons, studied martial arts for over 20 years, and is certified scuba dive master. Please welcome Phil Snyder. Thanks for that introduction. Can you guys hear me okay in the back? All right, so I was glad to hear that that uh, is going to be out in time for Christmas. That'll make a nice stocking stuffer, that, that balloon. Um, I feel like we, we've been talking all the conference about diet and VLCD, so I'm going to just rehash a lot of what we've already talked about, but hopefully add some things to your kind of thought process about why, you know, VLCD versus LCD versus just a ketogenic diet, however many calories you want. Um, as uh, John said, I'm on the medical advisory panel for Robard. And what I want to talk today is a little bit about the overview of obesity treatment. We're well versed in that, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. And then some of the history behind VLCDs, what are the benefits, and what are some of the um, uh, side effects? And some of those we heard about already this morning and this afternoon. But I want to start out with a pretest question. Cause anybody, can, it, can anybody tell me why cows have hooves instead of feet? Because they lack toes. <laughs> so uh, obesity is very, very complicated for our patients. And I think it's important to keep always reminding ourselves this goes beyond just the physical part of, of the complications. So it really has a lot to do with their worldview, their self-image. As we heard about the sex talk earlier, the self-acceptance, self-awareness. Self-care oftentimes will change a lot as we bring somebody on this journey from you know, obese to less obese to closer to the normal weight. And also a lot about their planning skills. So we have to really get people to change how they show up, you know, because you heard the saying, a family that eats together or stays together, but also is obese together or healthy together, depending on how they learn. And I'm sure the other dietitians in the audience will, um, will realize, will recognize this, that, you know, we form a lot of our eating habits by the time we're three or four years old because we get those very early from our parents and, and it's deeply ingrained. And think about it, it's reinforced constantly. Coworkers, family, friends, magazines. I mean, we, we are being manipulated 24 hours a day subliminally and marketers really know how to separate us from our rent check. Also relationship skills, very, very important for people to navigate. The physical part, we've, we've talked a lot at this meeting about the metabolic uh, with joints, um, very interesting about different cancers, how those can increase the rate. I mean, it's kind of cool that you can help somebody really drop their rate of certain cancers just by losing their weight. Obviously, the GI we just heard about, heart, kidney. I'm sure any of you guys who are doing VLCDs, you notice people's renal function improves. And I think that's really nice that we've been able to answer that question, are VLCDs safe with somebody with kidney disease? And you know, the answer is yes. Because if you look at the average protein intake, it's about 165 grams a day. And you take that times 16%, that's the nitrogen content of protein. So that nitrogen load that we give somebody in a VLCD is much, much lower than the nitrogen load they get on a regular diet. So yes, it's high protein, but that's on a percentage basis. So it's very important to keep that in mind. And also a lot of the skin changes that people go through with obesity and then also with the weight loss. So financial obesity, 
lot of money involved here with all the all the prescriptions. I mean, we, we just talked, you know, yesterday about, you know, we're lucky if people can get Saxenda covered. We get it for $25 in, in my market if it is covered. If not, it's well over 1000 But, I mean, people are looking at so many medicines that they're on. And that's, I think, a message we have to keep drumming to our insurance companies. You know, when we're helping people get their weight down, a small amount, much less than they want for cosmetic reasons, but a small amount really helps decrease the utilization of medications. And they have increased meals out, which really does a uh, big impact on the financial because you, you don't think about that in cumulative sense. Like somebody's talking about the total chow intake this morning with the rats. I mean, our total expenditure for uh, food goes really high when we're eating out. And I was happy to see um, in a couple of restaurants I went to where they had the calories listed next to the desserts. And so it's have, nice to have the price with that. But that certainly changed my choice of the dessert when I saw, you know, 1,200 calories for one of the things that was kind of tasty, but not worth that. Also, absenteeism. And I don't know if you guys have heard this term, the presenteeism. Somebody's there, they clock in, but they're not really working. That's kind of a, what we expect to see in a, a Dilbert cartoon, you know, where they ask the question, you know, how many people work here? And they say, oh, about 40%. <laughs> and just the discrimination that we still have for uh, people who are obese and don't have chairs that fit, seats that fit, they have to get the seat belt extenders. I mean, there's a lot of, I just went to our Robard conference in St. Louis and rode up the arch in the car. And the door to get in is about two feet wide and about four feet tall. And five people fit in a little pod to go up to the top. You're not going to get in there if you weigh over 220 pounds. So, I mean, a lot of people can't enjoy a lot of things that they enjoy, that they want to do, and the rides they can get on. They just can't really participate in life. So we all know about this uh, triangle or this pyramid that we've seen a lot with, with, um, with obesity treatment. But... According to Photoshop, Einstein just really simplified it really well. All you have to do is just healthy diet and 45 minutes of exercise a day. Of course, this was this uh, um, website they have where they say, you see a lot of stuff on the internet that'll pop up. It's like, here's the magic diet fix. So I was really happy to hear that we were talking about some of the newer novel um, uh, approaches with the uh, with the different combinations of the medications and you know obviously looking at the medications they're on to screen them yes yeah, that's, that's an easy win if you're switching from you know I tell people Paxil means 20 pound weight gain in French and if you get them off of that to Lexapro I mean that's an easy low hanging fruit and I was happy to hear also about the HIT training this morning with the exercise approaches. Obviously, you pick somebody that's appropriate for that since it is high intensity, but also a lot of the mental and emotional approaches. When we heard about this talk this morning where she's talking about all the apps on the phone, and there's this whole thing called gamification where if you turn things into a game, it'll draw people into it. We see that really successfully done with kids and diabetes. You make a game out of how low can you get your A1C. And, um, and so we're able to do that with, I mean, whenever I see I'm close to my steps for the day on my Garmin, I'll go out and walk around a little bit. And I know some people will do jumping jacks or, you know, shake around a little bit. So sometimes just to get that extra goal and, and if you can make a game of it, it makes a big difference. So what are the benefits of a VLCD? Well, first of all, what do you think is the most extreme recorded fast? Okay, who says 382 seconds? Okay, we know we can get longer than that. How about 382 hours? 382 days? 382 months? Fast and furious? <laughs> 382 days. It was recorded, 27-year-old year, uh, male in Scotland, a little multivitamin, non-caloric uh, lipids, and he went from 465 down to 180. And at five years later, he kept it down to 196. So if you guys are interested in that, you have this reference. So what is a VLCD? Well, according to Dr. Google, when you go and search VLCD diet, it takes a little over a half second and you get 1.5 million results. So a lot of people talk about VLCD diets. Um, 
the oldest PubMed reference I could find was the Pittsburgh group, and I couldn't find who that was, but they had some stuff starting all the way back in the 1930s about doing VLCDs. And we know typically it's about 800 calories a day. Some people will manipulate that up a little bit higher, a little lower. I know some people who did some work with the um, HCG diet were trying to do the 500 calories a day. Um, but, but this is what you're going to see most often is the 800 calories a day. Most people are going to do the meal replacements. It's easy. It's a stimulus control. We've seen that through some studies. It just helps people with their not having to choose from so many options. And oftentimes when the number of options goes up, people just don't choose. I mean, think about that when you go to the drugstore and you have a cold. And you're trying to see, you know, what in the sea of antihistamines and decongestants, sometimes people just, you know, shut down. Usually they are ketogenic. This is a really nice review article in American Journal of Clinical Nutrition talking about some of the features of VLCDs. Typically, you're going to get three to five pounds a week loss, like we heard from John yesterday and, and, um, and Ethan. And... Remember, your ortho folks will tell you for every one pound loss, it's an effective deloading of that joint by five pounds. So it's a one to five ratio. So it doesn't take a whole lot of weight loss before they'll be ready for that hip or that knee replacement. And those are really good referral centers for you, too, if you don't have the ortho sending you folks. Make sure and reach out to them. We forget about how much we take for granted just walking with our balance, our coordination, our agility, and we get somebody who's obese, that really throws things off. And especially you ask a woman who's pregnant and she's had her body habitus change over a quick period of time, there's a little bit of balance issue. So when people are gaining weight at that weight or when they're losing weight, think about that. And remember, that's one of the four components of exercise. Cardio, strength, flexibility, and balance. So make sure you're encouraging your patients to go all four of those areas, not just the cardio. And activities of daily living with just a little bit of weight loss, and including intimacy, like we heard about a few, a couple of lectures ago, makes a big impact on that. And because of the balance, fewer injuries. I mean, we know you fall down, break a hip, a third don't make it out of the hospital, a third make it out just fine, and a third are going to have long-term complications. It's kind of sensitive. Also, decreased fat. So not only subcutaneous fat, like we saw on the slide before about, uh, about the, the no scars, but also the mental fat. And remember when that kind of got some attention a few months ago? Is this another organ system? It's because it's so hormonally active and has such an impact on the rest of our body. And that was a great slide that John showed yesterday of the, the flattening of that central adiposity with somebody went on a VLCD before and after. And also the ectopic uh, fat that we see around the liver, the pancreas, and the pericardium, that drives a lot of the dysfunction that we see. And that goes away very quickly. I mean, a lot of uh, folks will put people on a very low calorie type diet before surgery because it shrinks the liver so quickly. It actually gives them more space to operate. Multiple metabolic parameters that we've talked about you know, insulin, glucose, we talked about this triglycerides going down, leptin sensitivity improves. Is anybody here measuring leptin with their patients? I started doing that about three or four years ago, and um, the lab that I use, True Health Diagnostics, they've started increasing their limit a little bit on the leptin, but I will oftentimes get people in whose leptin is well over 180 or 200. The ideal range is below 20. And that will fall very quickly, and it really m mirrors their hunger. So we know when we get somebody on VLCD, if it's done right, their hunger really gets blunted in a few days. And so we bring them back a month or two later, and that 180 leptin is cut in half, and then will continue to go down. And if you look at somebody's leptin, and it's more than twice their BMI, they are very leptin resistant and they're just hardwired to overeat. So I tell people, I'm like, it's not your fault. You're hardwired to overeat. Tell people if they try to get you to eat one cookie and it won't hurt you, just tell them I'm leptin resistant. I can't handle that. And they won't know what you're talking about and they'll leave you alone. But if people have a big leptin resistance, they, are, they have to be an abstainer. There are a few people who can have half a cookie and put it back. 
Blaze figured that out. Remember the old commercial, can't have just one? Realists can't have just 10. But if somebody has a leptin resistant, tell them to, to be careful and, and, and just keep out of sight, out of mind. Because we've seen a lot of times people have their trigger foods and they had that one food and this it's game over. Inflammation really has... Is that fasting? It's not a fasting level. Mm -mm. The other one you might get if you do the leptin is adiponectin, and that is the ideal is to get that as high as possible. That's a good anti-inflammatory uh, hormone, and that takes a while to come up. That's, that's more six to nine months before you'll get a full increase in that. Inflammation really drops. We do C-reactive protein uh, myeloperoxidase, which is a, 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 an enzyme that, that really is reflective of not only um, excess adipose, but also of, of heart health. If somebody has an elevated uh, CRP plus an elevated MPO, the, their risk for MI is very, very high. And also, I've seen anecdotally, if somebody's MPO is really high, they oftentimes have undiagnosed sleep apnea or they're not wearing their mask or their mask hasn't been changed in five years. And so if I see that really high, just ask them, I was like, do you have sleep apnea? And their wife or their spouse or their husband will say no, but they sure sound like it. Um, LFTs, oftentimes somebody has a fatty liver and you put them on a VLCD, it's not uncommon for the LFTs to go up a little bit and then to come down. As we, we, we think, it's because the liver is metabolizing that fat and getting rid of it. But I haven't seen any well-designed studies to figure out why that is. And then also, the, like we said, the GFR. And just a reminder, if you have someone taking supplements and they're taking creatine, that will make the creatinine higher and that's not quite as reliable. So you might want to get a cystatin C on them instead. That's not as uh, altered by that creatinine level uh, going up because of the creatine supplement. Creatine helps people build muscle more. Also, it uh, helps with people with enlarged atria. It, with the risk of AFib really goes down with the VLCD. And the pericardial fat goes down and your arteries become less stiff and you have better blood flow. We think that's partially because of this, the less stiff arteries, but also because of the nitric oxide that will increase its production as they get more healthy. So here's a picture of the pericardial fat. If you send somebody for an echocardiogram, ask your cardiologist to comment on the pericardial fat. And it's nice to see if you can get a pre and post on these. Here's we see a, a trial where they had people on a low carb diet and physical activity, but you can see some of the intrahepatic fat as it goes down. And you see this liver has got a lot less to deal with. And I've heard a lot of uh, gastroenterologists talk about the intrahepatic fat being elevated as like a bunch of beach balls in the liver and it's trying to do its, its work when I mean, it's got all that in the way. So what are the benefits from emotional, spiritual, and mental? If you put somebody on a good plan, you're going to help them improve their planning skills with their diet, exercise, and their sleep. Has anybody here ever heard of a book called The Power of When? There's a book called The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle, but The Power of When is all about discovering your chronotype. What's your best sleep patterns, your best eat, uh, eating patterns, your best exercise patterns? If you go to The Power of When... Dot com, and, or if you just Google that, Power of When and Quiz, you can answer some questionnaires and it'll tell you what's your chronotype and which type are you, uh, what's your best time to go to sleep, best time to wake up. It's pretty accurate. I tell it to a lot of my patients. And out of the four types, the one most common is the bear. And about 50% of us are the bear. They do best. They go to bed at 11, get up at 7, biggest meal in the morning, smallest at night. And it can really give a patient a good frame to remodel their day on if they come to you and they just have no good planning skills. Like I, I learned as a dietitian, I was just amazed how many times people would come in with diabetes and they did not know what a, a normal plate of food should look like. They just had been sort of making it up as they go. So it's a lot of basic teaching that we have to do to folks and don't assume that they come in knowing a lot. And also as they start to lose weight, this self-image and self-acceptance really goes up, but um, you have to be careful that 
do you know if they have people around them who aren't making change too? We've all heard about the saboteurs who will do that. There's a thing called a crab pot mentality where you have a bunch of crabs in a pot and one tries to climb out, the other ones grab it and pull it back down. So be aware that you'll have some people that come in and they lose 20 pounds, they're starting to feel good, and their family, what are they asking them? Are you sick? Yeah, I don't know about that diet. That's kind of weird. That VLCD 800, oh, I don't know. That, that didn't sound good. You, you ought to stop that. So be aware they're getting a lot of input to, to steer them the other way. Also, when, when we talk about well-being and worldview, what are the stories that they tell themselves? You know, how should I show up to the world and, and do I deserve to be healthy? What's my body image that, that I should have? Um, am I supposed to be one of the people that can go out on the beach and, and just have fun and not worry about what I look like? That's a major shift for people as we take them through this. So sometimes you might have to do a little expectations ahead of time to set that up. And, and if you can, like we heard on the sex talk this morning, have their spouse come in with them because that can make a big impact on their relationship. And oftentimes, if you take them through this successfully, and they read their books that you recommend. One I recommend to everybody is change anything. That gives you a lot of scripting on what do you do when somebody tries to give you that food. Somebody says, let's go out to eat at the donut shop. It gives them a lot of tools on how to manage that so they can show up to those relationships and have much, much better uh, management skills. And then this renewed sense of hope because people come to you because they haven't figured it out on their own. That's why we see a lot of people that come in in March and April. They've tried the New Year's resolution. They've tried to join the gym, the personal trainer, and by March or April, they know the reunion's coming up or the cruise or the vacation, and they throw in the towel, and like, that's it. I'm hiring a professional. Similar to AA, sometimes people just have to say, I'm going to turn it over to a higher power. And not saying we're their higher power, but sometimes people come in and they're like, well, I don't want to do your program exactly how it is. I want to modify it a little bit. I want to do this and this and this. It's important to listen to what's in, what, what they think they want to have, but let them know this is a tried and true process. Um, we use the Robard New Direction program. I like it because it's easy. It's plug and play. There's a lot of other programs out there that are also plug and play, but they've been around for you know several years. And so there's a rhyme and reason and a method to the madness. So get people to kind of lay down their expectations a little bit and put a little trust into the process. Also, these chronic self-care patterns for stress management, self-soothing. A lot of people turn to food for that dopamine hit, the serotonin hit, the norepinephrine hit. So you have to teach them some other ways that they can manage themselves when stress shows up, not if. And again, it's really important to look at the non-physical parts of the exercise when you get into a lot of these things with the, uh, with the stress. And then if you don't get adequate sleep, your stress man your your uh, conflict management skills go down. Your hunger goes way up. We've seen studies with ghrelin how it increases when you don't get enough sleep. And also, um, I was glad to hear that we touched yesterday on some of the intermittent fasting, some of the uh, new things that are coming out with the meal timing, and also different things with the food choices. And that's why I think the meal that are prepared can help us with being able to cut down on some of those uh, variety of choices that people have. And finally, it saves money because if you can prevent them from needing a joint replacement, uh, people come in and oftentimes ask, well, how much does it cost? And I'm like, well, the first question I ask them is, do you eat out? Because if you eat out, you know, several times a week, you're going to save a ton of money by coming on this program and just eat these meal replacements instead of your, the, all the going out. Um, saved relationships. This is, uh, I think, should have a little asterisk by it. If one, of, if they both members of a, a relationship were, were closer to normal weight when they got together and one gained weight, you tend to see an improvement in the relationship. If they both are very heavy and one loses weight, sometimes we see the opposite effect. They get a little suspicious. Now their partner's getting attention. They wonder how attractive they are to other people. So it takes a lot of uh, concerted effort for both of them to go through this together. Also, unfortunately, there's a still a lot of discrimination. There's people that don't get jobs because of their weight, or they don't get the raises and promotions that they deserve because of their weight. And oftentimes, they don't have as much job satisfaction because this 
kind of sometimes it's just like junior high again, where you don't get kicked, we don't get picked for the kickball team. And uh, sometimes you're not on projects and they're, they're, you know, a lot of them, times people do experience that in the, in the workplace. Genetics and epigenetics. I love thinking about epigenetics because we're born with DNA, but what we do really affects our DNA. And I tell patients when you have a family member who has diabetes, you've inherited a diabetic dimmer switch. You have your hand on that dimmer switch. You can have it in the off position or the on position, depending on your weight, your stress levels, your exercise, how you take care of yourself. And so remind patients, they have a lot of power over the expression of those genes. And so when we put people on a VLCD diet, we put them on the exercise program, and they teach them these coping skills, it really has an impact on their genes. I mean, George Burns probably would still be alive if he didn't smoke his 16 cigars a day. So he was, he was dealt a good uh, uh, hand of, of the gene cards, but I'm sure his epigenetics had a big role in that. The gut flora, you know, stay tuned. There's a lot developing here about how we can manipulate that and change it with different supplements, with different diets. Um, but when we uh, pair this with exercise, especially more of the cardiovascular exercise, you can actually get some metaplasia of some of the fast twitch muscle to slow twitch. The importance of that is slow twitch gets a lot better blood flow. So you're able to use that muscle as a sink for triglycerides to use for fuel and for glucose to use for fuel. So the cardio, if somebody gets in better shape, it helps them stay in shape better and it will help with the long-term maintenance of that weight loss. But that's real key to reinforce to your patients. It's not gonna help you lose a lot of weight quickly, the exercise. It helps you keep that weight off for long-term. Also, we, we talked about the um, relationships work and then that crab pot mentality. But this is one caveat you want to think about with patients when they have the typical mentality that comes in. You know, excess is okay as long as you don't ever do it. When they start exercising, intense diet changes can be helpful if you've done, listen to your body, you follow the program, you do everything you're supposed to. But how many of you have had patients come in, you put on a VLCD, and they're like, well, he said I can lose two to two or three to five pounds a week, but I'm going to lose more than that. I'm going to get a personal trainer. I'm going to get a boot camp class going. I'm going to do the couch to 5K. And how many of you have had where their weight, weight loss is going down all of a sudden it plateaus? So John mentioned yesterday one strategy is to give them a little bit extra food around the exercise before and after. Or sometimes you have to make talk to them and say, let's ratchet your exercise down just a little bit during this part where you're in the rapid weight loss. The other side effects that you can have are the medical. Constipation is probably the most common. Um, does anybody here use Epic for the EMR? I got so tired of typing out the stuff, I made a smart phrase in, in Epic for constipation. And, and if you guys want it, I can send it to you in the Word document and you can just plug and play back, create your own uh, smart phrase. But I just got tired of talking about it because it's, it's it can be a fairly common issue. And I go ahead and tell people up front, if you think you're prone to constipation, get on some Miralax or get on the Docalax um, for a stool softener. Just go ahead and, and get that done. And I have all the instructions laid out for if they uh, can't get rid of the constipation with just that. The frequent urination, a lot of people are going to complain of, but it's just part of what comes along with it because you're diuresing. Remember, it's three parts water to one part glycogen is how we store glycogen. So when you're getting rid of a lot of those excess carbs, a lot of excess water comes along with that too. So that's also important to remember where somebody goes off the diet for a day or two or weekend, they didn't gain eight pounds of fat over that cruise. They just had a, a lot of fluid shifts in there because they've gained that extra glycogen back and they've gained more of that water and then get rid of that fairly quickly too. The dehydration can happen. Um, the ketones that are produced from this will compete for uric acid for excretion with the kidneys. So you always see the uric acid creep up a little bit. For a lot of people, that's no big deal, but some of those who are gout prone you may have to put them on a medicine to prevent a gout flare if they've been prone to having them several times a year. Also, when you're in the induction phase, a lot of times people will 
we'll call it fatigue, but when you ask them, it's kind of more like, well, I feel a little mellow. I kind of feel a little more relaxed. Things just don't tend to bother me quite as much. But some people do have a little more fatigue during that time. And occasionally, you'll have folks that have hair loss, where it'll get stuck in that TE phase for a few months. Um, Anecdotally, you'll hear people talk about a little extra biotin and a little extra fish oil to help. I know of no randomized controlled studies, but those are pretty low side effect. The, the cost is not very high, so it's worth a try. We also know that uh, gallbladder stones can happen. You get a little sludgy in the gallbladder, so be on the lookout. Somebody has a little right upper quadrant pain, been on the program for a couple of months. Um, the skin we talked about, there are some laser uh, techniques, there's some different creams that people will post pictures on Facebook before and after. Uh, so I tell patients, you know, go, go, go talk to somebody you know that's selling this type of cream and not give it a try. Uh, but that's one thing that a lot of people are a little apprehensive of and, and not so happy about. But if you think about cosmetic surgery on your internal organs versus some sagging skin, and less medicine and feeling better. So I know which way to go. And then also the, um, the electrolyte disturbances. So with the hyponatremia that can happen because you're diuresing, you have a lot of potassium um, changes and you can also get arrhythmias. And so that's why we do EKG. We make sure their uh, QTC interval is not prolonged, 440 in males, 460 for females. And if they are prolonged when you first get them in, you can put them on a little magnesium recheck them in a week or two. Most of us are walking around a little magnesium deficient. And unfortunately, the blood tests don't always tell you what the intracellular magnesium is. It may be close to normal. So if you're curious, just do a DTR. And if they have really brisk DTR, uh, uh, deep tendon reflexes, they're probably a little mag deficient. So if any of you have ever done any OBGYN, you know if you give a woman who's preeclamptic a lot of magnesium coming in, baby comes out a little floppy for a while. So the cost of the meal replacements, that's something that people are going to ask you about. Again, look and see what their current intake of food is and how much that costs. And then also, you may have to have a prescription for preventing gout. Some folks may decide to do the abdominoplasty. Rarely, we haven't had anybody in our program in nine years have uh, had their gallbladder removed, but it, it does happen. And then also, this is one that people enjoy the cost of, is buying new clothes. And I think the big question is that is, do you get rid of your old clothes or not? I encourage them to get rid of them so they don't have room to grow back into. So obesity is multi, multifactorial. You got to work on the, the physical part of it, the diet, the which diet are you going to follow, the VLCD. I think they're very safe in the right population. They're effective and they're, they're very affordable overall. And you got to also get somebody on your team or like Ethan said yesterday with his 30-minute follow-ups where he really gets, really gets to know his patients well, be ready to go there and do some of that motivational interviewing. Do some of that problem solving and teach them some of those skills because that's what's going to keep the weight down. Losing the weight initially is not that hard if they follow the plan, but it's keeping that weight off. And then telling people it may take, you know, two or three times if you see them start to struggle, and, and that's okay. I mean, we know people that quit smoking, sometimes it's five, six, seven times before they're, they're successful with keeping that, that uh, cigarettes away. This has been a Dana Miller Video Network presentation.